Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the AAI podcast. I'm your host, Jason Sylvester, a.k.a. Diogenes of Mayberry. And this week we're joined by Paul McMahon, who's an activist down in Australia, who's here to tell us about what he's been up to and a little bit about his journey to atheism. So I'd like to remind everyone, please like and subscribe and uh, hopefully uh, drop some suggestions if you'd like to see some future guests or some topics you'd like us to talk about. So let's jump in with Paul. And Paul, thank you for joining me, especially uh, the last minute request. So thanks for it's coming on. It's a pleasure, Jason. Pleasure. Right. Yeah, so why don't you just give us a little bit of your background? Like, were you were you raised as a Christian and became an atheist or you were always an atheist? Or how did, how did you get to this point in your life? Okay. Um, I haven't given this very much thought. I mean, your, your listeners should be aware that this was a very... Uh, I was invited to do this at short notice, so I, I really haven't given a lot of thought, but yeah. Um, my background, no, I, I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Sydney in Australia, and I had, I think, a pretty ordinary childhood in terms of uh, religious training. My, my family was not particularly religious, but um, my mother, I think, just because it was the conventional thing to do, sent me and my siblings to Sunday school from about the age of, I don't know, five or six, something like that. In fact, I still have the Bible that my mother gave me when I was a very, very small child, the Bible she gave me to take with me to Sunday school. Um, um, but anyway, no, I, I went to Sunday school for most of my childhood, at least up until, you know, my early teens, and uh, actually until about my mid-teens, and I even uh, did the training uh, for what we call confirmation. I'm, I'm pretty sure you understand what that means, yeah? In for the, which, uh, which denomination? It was the Church of England. Okay. Okay. So... Um, I, so I was basically on and off going to church and Sunday school and youth club and things like that until about probably the age of 16. And then I just lost interest and didn't go anymore. And like a lot of people, was probably pretty agnostic about religion. I didn't really have any strong attraction to it or any strong dislike of it. It just really wasn't much of an of much interest to me. However, I, I'm the sort of person I was, uh, I've always been a fairly curious person. So I always, in the back of my mind, I suppose, through early adulthood, um, was a little bit curious about it in terms of, you know, why, why were so many people in the world religious? Uh, why did so many people believe in God and, you know, it was just a concept that seemed a little bit peculiar to me and I wasn't totally convinced either way. But um, I, I didn't go to university actually until I was in my early 30s. And then at university I was introduced to anthropology. Now, one thing anthropology did for me was it opened my mind to the exploration of human culture and human history. So uh, you'd be aware that, you know, there is, you know, the study, of, the study of human religions is just one subset of the huge field of study that is anthropology. However, um, in my last probably couple of years of university, I decided to pursue it a little bit more deeply. So I, <clears throat> I um, pardon me. I I actually did an honours an honours year in, as part of my university degree, and I decided for my dissertation to study something related to religion. So I chose to look at the influence of Christian missionaries on indigenous tribal peoples in the Philippines. 
So I read a lot about religion in general and particularly from a anthropological perspective. I also read a lot about Christianity and a lot about the activities of missionaries and what they get up to and how they go about converting people. And um, anyway, so... Did, did you focus on any one particular region or tribe? No, just the, well, the Philippines in general, because the Philippines actually has many, many small ethnic groups. Um, I think they have something like 60 or 70 different, distinctively different ethnic groups in the Philippines. And a lot of them are quite small and regional, and many of them are what we would call tribal or indigenous. But right. um, Well, I ask because my, my ex was from an indigenous tribe up in the northern mountains. And it's only okay. been the last it's only been the last hundred years that they've yeah. converted to Christianity because it was so yeah. remote and mountainous. The Catholics were never able to penetrate. The Spanish never had control of it. So it yeah. wasn't only it wasn't only until the early 20th century when when the Americans and guns and things that, that you know they had exactly. the ability to actually penetrate. And I think uh, there's a there's a town called Sagada uh, near near Baguio that's the yeah. only Protestant majority town in all of the Philippines, and that's only because the Church of England missionaries got there first. That's, okay. So that's why I was asking if maybe you had focused on some specific areas and, and kind of fell, no, fell into those. Yeah. No, I didn't really focus on a specific area, but uh, okay. yeah, that's very interesting. And um, uh, you'd be aware that, you know, it was really not until a, about the early 20th century when the United States um, took control of the Philippines after the American-Spanish War that they had. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the American churches, American, well, not only Protestant, but of course the Catholics were already there with the Spanish. But I, I believe a lot of um, American Protestant churches decided that, you know, they needed to get over there and get their share of the converts, you know, so to speak. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I know the Americans, they, they did quite a bit to limit the power of the church in the Philippines as well. Not not a lot, but especially okay. of, the, of the friar states, like they, they disestablished the Catholicism as the national religion, which I think has since been reversed, but uh, they, they did try to, to limit some of the power and sell off some of the, the landed estates of the, of the friars and the brotherhoods. Sure. So yeah. it was interesting. But, okay. Yeah, but basically, I mean, that that is my orientation to atheism is basically because you know i went to university i studied uh, anthropology and then became interested in uh, studying religion from an anthropological perspective and so from that and from you know from all my reading i basically during my university degrees reached a point where i realized i wasn't an agnostic that i was actually an atheist that i actively uh, disputed the you know the mythology around God and religion. So okay, and then is that in the background? Yeah, that's that's fine. So it's fairly similar to me. I grew up in a Protestant church, went to Sunday school until my, my teens, then went off to university and basically read all about it. And then over time became an atheist. So I think that's I think yeah. that's a fairly typical journey for for most in the in the community. They probably come from a religious background. And, and as they've been exposed to the world and education have, have slowly left it behind. So I don't think yeah. our story is all that atypical. There, there are a handful who've never believed, but I would say they're probably the minority. So, yeah. okay. And so I understand that you, you've been fairly or somewhat active either in the past or even currently with some of the political issues uh, in there in Australia. So maybe you could tell us um, about what you're doing there. Look, I, I, you know, through the small political party that I was a member of, I, um, I suppose I became more interested in the link between religion and politics. And that was an area that um, I suppose with the, the other people in the small political party that I belonged to, we were, we were very keen on getting religion out of politics. Um, you may or may not know that the current Australian Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, yeah, he's a, he's a um, publicly a practicing Christian. 
uh, a number of his colleagues in the Liberal National Party government are also practicing Christians. And he has spoken a number of times of how important his religion is to his personal, uh, his personal life, his personal orientation to life, I suppose. And I know that some of my friends um, very actively dislike him because they, they believe that he is too religious and they don't trust him to be a prime minister for all Australians. And a lot of people are worried that his religion uh, has too strong an influence on his policy making or his you know, whatever he does as prime minister. I used to think, I used to agree with them. I've become a little bit less convinced that it's an issue in the last year or two, I have to say. And um, I think some of my atheist friends are a little bit too obsessed with that aspect of his persona, if you like. Has, has he been actively campaigning for Christian privilege in Australian society? Yes, 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 indeed. He has. Um, there's been a, a bill on the back burner for a while, and it's a bill to protect people from discrimination. In other words, to protect religious people from discrimination. So a lot of my atheist friends are concerned that that will extend privilege to religious people at the expense of non-religious people. And I think it's a, it's a valid fear. Um, we, so, we haven't so really seen, we haven't seen the details of the bill yet too much. So, so it's a little bit it sounds. It sounds a bit like you know blasphemy laws that you know we have to protect people's feelings from from criticism. So. A little bit like that, yeah. And in fact, okay. that's probably the form that it will take. It will be like, um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, how far it will go? Will it will it will it punish people for uh, ridiculing religion or? insulting religion because for me that would be a line too far you know i mean i think everybody should be in a liberal democracy should be free to to practice their religion if they're religious but of course i think most i think you would agree that uh, we have to maintain a high degree of secularism in a liberal democracy to make the country fair and free for everybody, of course, not just religious people and not just non-religious people. Yeah, I was I was a little bit shocked. But we've had a few Australians on recently. We had uh, previously you had oh, one of the AAI board members, Stella Thomas, on, who's also mm -hmm. a member of the Rationalist Society of Australia. Okay. We had a couple of a uh, couple of podcasters on who are ex Pentecostalist. Um, it's a bit shocked because I mean Australia, at least to me sort of has this image this persona of being you know very liberal very open-minded and yet there seems to be like from what stella was telling me there's this underlying christianity in australia that seems to be somewhat counterintuitive uh she mentioned specifically that there there is in australia a chaplaincy service in schools but it's all christian chaplains That's so that right. seems that seems a little odd that they'd be privileging <laughs> Christianity in the chaplaincy service over humanist chaplains or Muslim chaplains or Hindu chaplains. Wouldn't Why is it just Christians? Yeah. Because the Christians uh, have the inside running with the government. And um, we, we also had a, um, a Catholic Christian prime minister in about 2013, a man named Tony Abbott. And he pushed it very hard to get the Christian chaplaincy in the schools. and a lot of funding, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every year goes to fund it. So, you know, for a secularist like me, it's not only objectionable in terms of brainwashing children, <laughs> it's objectionable because they're spending taxpayers' money to fund it. Exactly. And so, so there's no, that I understand that there's no functional separation of church and state in Australia, in the Australian constitution. So this chaplaincy service didn't violate any of that separation. No, not really. But um, yeah, yeah, it's a contentious issue, and I, I, of course, personally, I'd rather there, 
there was no religious instruction in school of any kind. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, we, we had religious instruction when I was a school kid. I survived it. I still came out as an atheist. So I... Well, pres presumably a chaplaincy service is basically counselling. So if you're struggling with, you know, teenage That's angst, you can, you can go and talk to the chaplain. But, but That's true. So, but they, so also guess, have, they also have religious instruction in, okay. in primary schools anyway. Yeah. Okay. In primary yeah, public schools. Right. The chaplaincy is objectionable basically because, yes, um, the chaplains officially are not allowed to proselytize. Unofficially, it's pretty obvious that they do. I used to be a high school teacher some years ago and I shared my staff room with the school chaplain, interestingly. And he was definitely actively trying to uh, recruit young Christians among the school body. Even though officially that wasn't his role, I, I know for a fact he was doing it because I used to see the kids come to talk to him at the staff room, you know, and they were there to talk about religious matters. They weren't there to, to talk about, you know, um, having trouble with, you know, mum and dad or something like that. You know, they weren't just seeking counsel. He, he was actively involved in recruiting young Christians for sure. And have there, have there been any cases that you're aware of where a chaplain has overstepped and has, you know, say a, a, a young LGBT student has come to them for, for advice and, and they've been chastised for their, their evil ways? Has anything no. like that ever happened? No, um, it's... Um, it's, it's more than 15 years since I left high school teaching, so I've been away from that for quite a while, and no, I don't have any specific examples of that to give you. Is, it, are there, is there any idea of how, how utilized this chaplaincy service is? Like if it's volunteer, then you know, there might only be a, a handful of kids in each school who are, who are going to the chaplain. So oh, I no, imagine- no, there are a lot of chaplains in schools. Um, they, they are paid, they don't get a, high salary but they are paid and um, I think part of the funding comes from the religious organizations they're attached to I think the government basically contracts out the chaplaincy work to religious organizations and then they recruit and train and place the chaplains but I imagine they're not busy eight hours a day during the school day they're probably like the, the odd time someone comes in or are they, are they fairly well utilized? I, I think they're pretty well utilized. I think school principals will also uh, utilize them um, for other activities. You know. And is it, so it's not likely to, to go away anytime soon while you have a Pentecostal <laughs> prime minister? No, it doesn't look like going away anytime soon, basically because we have a government that uh, likes it and wants to keep it going. Despite the fact that people are speaking out about it and that it's technically oh, discriminatory but, against every other faith and non-belief. Yeah, so. yeah, but you have to keep in mind the people who are speaking out uh, about it are organisations like the Rationalist Society of Australia and, you know, small fringe groups and the government really doesn't take much notice of them. And, you know, your average everyday Aussie uh, is just, you know, getting on with their lives. They they really don't take much notice of things like that. You know, it's just background noise to most people. I don't think yes, they sir. really care. Are you are you working on anything new? I understand you you used to be doing some podcasts, but you're not you're not doing that anymore. Or you no no. <laughs> I, I, I was doing a podcast with some friends. Um, it was basically a secular podcast looking at the news and current affairs. Um, <clears throat> I, I basically, I did it for a few years and I left um, for personal reasons. I, I started to feel like the, the podcast was becoming a little bit too uh, pa polit partisan politi political, if you like. It was becoming quite partisan. The, the guy who runs it 
uh, is associated with one of the main political parties here in Australia. And I've become increasingly disillusioned with that particular party. And I, I just, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be promoting that party or assisting them in any way. And um, I just decided that I didn't want to be associated with the podcast anymore. Okay. So uh, have you got anything on the horizon that you're, you're working on? Right now, uh, nothing at all. I've, I've sort of withdrawn from everything except just chatting with friends on the internet. I've, I think I mentioned to you I've, I've recently moved out of the city, so I'm sort of living in a semi-rural area now and um, I don't get out much. <laughs> and so my, my activities are basically just with friends on the internet, so I'm not really active as a as an atheist, yeah. but just generally interesting. Okay, well, nice of you to come and tell us what uh, what you've been working on. But... Oh, okay. Not at so... all. It's my pleasure. Look, one thing I, I would say is, and and maybe you could give me your comment on this. Something I've become aware of in the last couple of years, especially, is that a lot of active atheists appear to assume that atheism is associated with the left of politics, you know, and there seems to be a, an assumption that a lot of people who are, if you like, on the conservative side of politician of politics are mainly religious. So what's, what's your, your feeling well, about that? There, there is, I, I would, you know, I would say there's some truth to that, you know, stereotypically that there stereotypical. is that. But, but there, there are obviously atheists on the right. There's um, yeah. Thomas Sheedy in the U.S., who I believe is on the advisory council uh, for AAI, is has a group that is dedicated to. Uh, it's a right wing atheist organization. They go to the Republican conferences in in the U.S. and you know show their faces and say, "Hey, not everybody in the Republican Party." is a, is a evangelical christian we're here too uh so there there is some truth to the, you know that you're you're right to be skeptical but i my gut feeling would be that i would say more atheists probably would tend to lean towards the left than than to the right and yeah. the, and religion does tend to correlate with with conservative values on the right so i so again there's correlation but you know there's not necessarily like in anything you know it's it's a it's a spectrum so yes indeed. But, yeah. look i i do i do sort of participate in chats in some atheist chat rooms on facebook and most of them tend to be american or north american and what i've noticed um, in a lot of the american ones is this very strong assumption that um people associated with the republican party are all religious nut jobs you know and, you know, I, I see a lot of comments uh, in these atheist chat rooms, a lot of comments critical of the Republican Party and uncritically praising the Democratic Party. And I find that interesting. Well, um, you, you, I mean, you probably need to understand the background context. So the, the reason why the Republican parties have become so aligned with evangelical Christianity was because back around 1980-ish, uh, three Republican strategists looked at Jerry Falwell and his moral majority and realized here's an inbuilt right wing base of a block of voters. So the Republican Party made a very strategic move to ally themselves to the moral majority and the Christian right. And it's basically been downhill ever since. So that's that's where you get such this really, really strong correlation between the right and and uh, evangelical Christianity. So because they they deliberately held hands and jumped into bed and spent the last forty years there frolicking, you know, fornicating with each other. Yeah, that's that good. Yeah, so. look, I know I know there's something in it. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I'm I'm a pretty pretty much unaligned myself with any political party these days, and I find myself sort of gravitating towards the centre. <laughs> yeah, well, that seems um, to be I, where most people are. Yeah, I, but I, I get a little bit, I get a little bit impatient, I suppose, when um, people in these atheist groups appear to operate on the assumption that 
if you're an atheist, you're left wing. And if you're, if you're not left wing, you know, if you're not an atheist, you're probably a conservative, you're probably a Republican or, or, or whatever equivalent, you know, conservative party um, people might belong to in a given country. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate. Yeah, I, yeah that's what, one of the things Tom Machine is working on to try to say, hey, you know, we're, we're out here too. So, so what, I know one of your fellow Australians and our former executive director, Michael Sherlock, um, he's been quite vocally criticizing that the, the hijacking of the atheist movement by these these left wing social justice warriors, you know, who, yes. you know, and the wokeism and it, it's, you know, the, exactly. you know, it's cannibalizing itself. So where, exactly. so where do you see the movement going? Movement, which movement? <laughs> well, the, the, the global atheist movement. Do you, do you yeah. see it do you know, moving forward? I, I don't really see it as a movement. I, I see it as a, um, as a personal orientation more than anything. I mean, you know, I, I, for me, atheism is simply a lack of belief in the supernatural. I mm -hmm. don't strongly associate atheism with any particular politics as such. And I mean, well, I, I suppose yeah. historically, I mean, you know, the, the communist movements of the Soviet Union, ex-Soviet Union, and the Chinese communists uh, were uh, very overtly very anti-religion. Um, so I guess there's that connection. Well, they just don't like competition for their ideology. So. Well, I, I think, yeah, I think they don't like competition, but I think a lot of them probably are pretty much atheists too, oh, which yeah. is fine. A lot of them are. So. <laughs> No, I think I, I would say atheism is a movement in the fact that people like us who are trying to fight this privilege of like the chaplaincy program, opposition to gay rights and women's rights, gay marriage, that kind of stuff. So in a movement in that way that we're we're advocating for basic human rights for everybody that has no religious privileges. Says, hey, my book says, you know, women should have rights and gays shouldn't get married and, and mm -hmm. Christian Christianity should be the dominant religion in schools. So that that's yeah. that's what I mean by a movement. So but Sure. Like this this wokeism seems to have hijacked a lot of it and, you know yeah. what you can say what you can't say and... exactly yeah and i i personally am very very against this woke bullshit that seems to be taking over you know our educational institutions and even our you know political institutions to some degree yeah. um I, I i think like any any radical departure it'll it'll peter it'll cannibalize itself and it will eventually peter out and i think a lot of them have started to see that the monster that they've created and it sure and is a monster backlash that's coming so. yeah. yeah 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 look okay. um i you know apart from that i i don't think australia is a particularly religious place um i certainly have the impression i haven't been to the united states or to canada I have the impression that the in, in the United States, religiosity is greater than here in Australia. Uh, you prob you may or may not be aware that here in Australia we've had at least a couple, probably two or three prime ministers who were not religious and who were probably atheists. If you if you had them in a in, in a quiet moment, you know, off camera, away from microphones, they probably would have told you they were atheists. Whereas in the United States, I don't think you can get elected that if you be political suicide. Career. There was uh, within the last say six, 10, 16 years, I think it was the two thousand eight election, if I remember correctly, during the Republican presidential primary. There was a Mormon, the governor of Utah. I think he was probably oh, governor yeah. of Utah. He's a Mormon, and they asked yeah, him yeah. In the primary. They asked everybody who believes in evolution, and he's I do, and gone the next day. Oh, really? Yep, he was out. So, just for saying he believed evolution. Yep. Really. He was gone. Wow. Yeah, and that's Amazing. why like this this hijacking of the Republican Party by like this anti-intellectual Christian right, it's it's yeah. really rather tragic. So. It is tragic. I mean, but particularly. In, yeah, particularly in you know countries which are technologically and socially relatively well developed wouldn't you think but you know this this is a conundrum that i've toyed with for many years 
probably you have too. I mean, you meet perfectly intelligent people who still believe the sky fairy is a real person, you know, and I've often wondered, you know, how can they be so smart and still believe such nonsense? Yep. But I, but I, I think it's partly, yeah, it's partly due to your, your individual education and life experience. And it's like I mentioned to you before that I shared a staff room when I was a high school teacher with the school chaplain. And I mean, he, you know, he was, I would say, average intelligence. You know, he was not particularly smart guy, but he wasn't stupid. And, um, he, you know, I, I once uh, challenged him to look at something in a, a senior high school history book, which had a picture of one of the old stepped pyramids from ancient Mesopotamia, you know. And to me, there was a link there be, with the, uh, the story of um, the Tower of Babel, you know, the Tower of Babel. And in ancient Mesopotamia, of course, they had, they had uh, temples at the top of these stepped pyramids. And, you know, some people have, have speculated that that was possibly the source of that ancient biblical story, the Tower of, the Tower of Babel. And uh, so, you know, I, I came across it in this senior high school history book. So I thought oh, I should show it to my friend, the chaplain. So I took it up to the staff room and I said, hey, look at this, look at this. Can you see the link between this and the ancient story of the Tower of Babel? He just wasn't interested. Now, wouldn't you think if he was an, a, a, an intellectually curious person, he would have th sort of had a little conversation with me about it? Yeah. He just was not interested. He had his, you know, his orientation to the biblical stories. He just wasn't interested in any extra information that might, you know, add another dimension to it. He just wasn't interested. Yeah. So you I think people... Me. Yeah. yeah, you reminded me of a, a story. It was just gobsmacked me. So I, I was working in China uh, a few years ago, and you know, there's not a lot of evangelical evangelical Christians in China. So I was actually really shocked that this happened. But my office happened to be next door to a language school, and I was in the elevator, and one of the language teachers was there with her student, and she brings up the Tower of Babel. Oh, we have all these languages because of the Tower of Babel. And I just couldn't keep my mouth shut. I'm like, what a load of crap <laughs> that is. You know, like, you're, you know, you're teaching, you know, not teaching, but, you know, you actually yeah. believe this and you're telling this to your students. Like, what? It's just, I couldn't believe she was telling somebody this. I know. So. It's, it's amazing that people cling to these, you know, childish myths. But they do. Yeah. They do. You know? yeah. Slowly, I mean, the, the demographics in the U.S. are changing. Like, uh, just yeah. this past year, that the ev evangelical Christians are no longer the the dominant demographic, but they're they yeah. are declining and declining quickly. So, That's hopefully, the, the outlier status that the U.S. has as a as a intellectually uh, uh, what's the word? industrially powerful country, technologically advanced, and yet highly religious, you know, they're yeah. very much the outliers. So, hopefully, we're going to see that change over the next generation. How about Canada? What's it like there? Uh, well, I haven't lived in Canada for over 20 years, but it, it was yeah. I worked in the US for five years and it was definitely a, a sea change in mentality. And I actually worked in the Midwest in Kansas City. Uh, so right, right in the, like, the buckle of the Bible Belt. Uh, and it was, it's definitely over there. Like I had colleagues all the time. Oh, you should come to church with me. And this, and that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely in your face there. So yeah. Way more so than I ever saw in Canada. Canada is probably much like Australia, similar population, similar Commonwealth background. So that's much more sort of laid back, liberal democracy. Yeah. Look, I, th I think it's only a matter of time in the United States as well, as you say, you know, the, the demographic is changing. The last time we had a national census in Australia, they changed the wording of the question asking for people of their religious orientation. And it threw up uh, a result of something like 30% of Australians were not religious. And there's another one due in the next year or so. And I believe 
some organizations probably like the rational rationalist association and others are have been lobbying the national body that conducts the census to change the wording again to make it even more easy for people who perhaps grew up in a religious family but no longer practice their religion to make it easier for people to declare on the census that they are in fact non-religious rather than tick the box of their family religion which a so lot of people would do atheism atheism wasn't on the census pre previously it, it it is on the census uh it was on the last census but of course atheism is not really a religion um right. so they've tried the to yeah very carefully word the question to get around that issue that some people think atheism is a religion or that some people think they should just tick the box of whatever religion their family has traditionally been associated with, you know? Yeah. Which is perhaps not an accurate re reflection of their true religious orientation. So I think most people are expecting the, ne the next national census in Australia will, will show that well over 30% of Australians are in fact not religious. And it could be even, you know, 40, 50%. So it's really quite a lot. Well, we'll be looking forward to that when it comes out. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Yeah, I think most, most countries do their census on the one years, and it's 2021. So you just had your census early this year, right, or earlier? Because I remember talking to Stella, but we were actually talking about that question. So your census was already done, right? Uh, so the we, results, I think the do, results should be They do it about right? every, every five years here. So, yeah. oh, that's right. Yes, we, we did one. Yes, you're right. You're right. It slipped my mind. We did it a few months ago. Correct. Okay. So the results should be out in the next few months. So. Cool. Well, I yeah, I don't know when that. the results. It, it could be could be in the new year sometime. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. why it slipped my mind because we have done it, but the results haven't come out. But yes. Okay. Well, I'll I'll definitely make a note to to check those out when they come out and and see yeah, it how should be doing. should be interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, I guess we're about the end of our time. Any, anything you'd like to wrap up with or we've, we've covered everything you wanted to talk about? Not really, not really. Um, no, I don't really have anything more to add. Okay, no problem. Okay, so well, thanks again for coming on, especially it was, it was last minute. Uh, you were Pleasure, a Jason. very <laughs> last minute guest as we scrambled to find someone to, to take some take up the time, but we're going to have this yeah, upcoming well, Wednesday. All right, well, I appreciate it, and thanks for coming on. And I'll, I'll send you the link offline for when uh, when it goes up. And okay. uh, as for everybody else, uh, again, please remember to like and subscribe, drop a note which, on what you like, and some some ideas you'd like to see for future guests, future topics, and we'll be happy to to look at them. So thanks again, everybody, and thank you, Paul, for coming on. And we'll see everybody in the coming weeks. All right, take care, everybody. Bye bye. bye. Okay, thanks for listening and don't forget we're on YouTube, so follow us on YouTube, just search for Atheist Alliance International and please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favourite podcast platforms, so make sure that you follow us on there as well. See you next time.